Chapter 1, The Agony of Lord Melbourne But his astonishment was greater, over when he turned and saw a stranger standing by a window, staring at him while holding a glass full of liquor and with his other hand a book of luxurious red cover. November 24, 1848, Brockett Hall, William Lamb, 2nd Viscount of Melbourne, better known as Lord Melbourne dies at his country home in Brockett Hall. The former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, the man who as head of government had ruled the gigantic British Empire in two different periods for a total of nearly seven years, now faced death, which in the end equalize all human beings. Although the death of this man is particularly painful. Because in fact Lord Melbourne had died years ago, almost nine years earlier to be more specific, on February 10, 1840, when the woman he loved married another man. That woman was none other than the Queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, Victoria. Lord Melbourne was already Prime Minister when the previous king, the uncle of Victoria, William IV died and the young woman one of only 18 years of age became monarch of the British Empire. Lord Melbourne was in charge of protecting the young and inexperienced Queen, of teaching her to perform her duties as head of state, and even served as private secretary, apart from prime minister. But his excessive implication caused Lord Melbourne to end up falling in love with the innocent and beautiful, but strong and willful, girl, who was young enough to be his daughter. The worst thing is that she also fell in love with him, but Lord Melbourne, with his older age and experience in life knew that his love was virtually impossible, and that Victoria could cost her crown, and precipitate the country into a political crisis and constitutional. She was the queen of the most powerful country in the world and he was a politician, although temporarily the most powerful politician in that same country, she was of royal blood at a time when it was usual for members of the royalty alone were married to other members of the royalty, while he was only a viscount of the minor nobility, and there were many more reasons, that could take advantage of the powerful enemies of Victoria to try to force her to abdicate. That is why Lord Melbourne, for a sense of duty and to protect the woman he loved, rejected Victoria's declaration of love, in Brockett Hall itself, breaking the hearts of both. That day when Lord Melbourne refused to accept the love that Victoria offered him, was really the day he began to agonize, his agony became acute when Victoria announced that she would marry another man, with a cousin of her, the German Prince Albert of saxe coburg and Gotha. The blow was very hard for Lord Melbourne, not only because she was going to marry another man, but because that meant that she had already forgotten him, because besides she seemed quite in love with her future husband. On the fateful day of marriage, Lord Melbourne had to make a great effort because, to make matters worse, the damn protocol dictated that he, as Prime Minister of the Kingdom, should play a relevant role in the ceremony, marching in front of the cortege of the bride to the altar and he standing almost next to the bride and groom at the altar, holding a huge ceremonial sword held high. Lord Melbourne would have wished to fall seriously ill so as not to have to endure stoically the torture of seeing the woman who loved to marry another a few steps from him. Lord Melbourne endured the situation pretty well even after the wedding when Victoria said goodbye affectionately him, before to go with her husband to enjoy the honeymoon. But afterward, when he reached the solitude of his home, Lord Melbourne collapsed. For many years he had the ill-healthful habit of sitting in a chair drinking alcohol every night until he fell asleep and always donned on the armchair, which barely used the bed in his bedroom. But that night he not only drank alcohol until he fell asleep in the armchair, but he also cried. Lord Melbourne, the serene and strong man who endured the biggest blows of life with an ironic smile and a calm gesture, that night he cried like a little boy. He cried with pain and sadness, with spite and self-pity, with resentment against everything and against everyone, including God and even Victoria, who had forgotten him so easily, if she had ever loved him seriously, he was afraid of think, because he knew that at that moment, on that damn night, Victoria would be in the arms of another man in a bed, giving her virginity, she experienced the sex for the first time. The 18 months following Victoria's wedding in which Lord Melbourne remained Prime Minister was held to him. During that time Lord Melbourne reduced to the minimum possible his meetings with Victoria, the minimum possible of audiences between a British Queen and her Prime Minister, 
and unlike the stage previous to the marriage, during which practically he lived in Buckingham Palace, after the wedding, Lord Melbourne almost never stepped in palace. He even reduced his exchange of letters or written messages with Victoria to a minimum, and his messages lacked the warm and intimate tone of before. When Victoria first became pregnant, it was another stab in the heart of Lord Melbourne, seeing her pregnant from another man's son to him was another source of endless suffering, though he tried to convince herself that he was happy for her. Not even the rumours about problems in the coexistence between Victoria and her husband served to him of petty consolation. For Lord Melbourne it was a small consolation that his party, the Whig Party, lost the next general election, and that a little more than a month later a vote of no confidence in the House of Commons forced him to resign as Prime Minister. Victoria's farewell to present his resignation was another bitter drink, because he saw that she was sad and tried to be affectionate, but he put on a mask of cold cordiality to keep at bay the feelings between both. And it was because deep down he had intended that this was the last meeting between the two in life, but he was not going to tell. And because he was broken with pain inside him in that meeting, and he had to make a great effort so that his own feelings did not overflow. That painful farewell was very different from the first meeting between both four years before, which had been practically love at first sight. When leaving the interview Lord Melbourne bitterly cried again in his house. The following years were hell for Lord Melbourne. Already retired from politics and public life, he locked himself in his country residence in Brockett Hall and completely isolated himself from the world. He even renounced the friendship of the few sincere friends he had, like Emma Portman, whom he dismissed with silly excuses not to see or write. The only people he talked to daily were the servants of Brockett Hall, with whom he spoke only what was strictly necessary. Apart from them he only spoke occasionally with his younger brothers Frederick, George and Emily when they came to visit him at Brockett Hall. For a while Victoria wrote him some letters, which he had to respond politely, but as his answers were not so enthusiastic and delayed a little in sending them, and as she also received pressure to stop writing, correspondence ceased. Becoming the Brockett Hall prisoner, Lord Melbourne committed suicide in slow motion. He increased the amount of alcohol he drank, which already used to be a lot. He ate very little, barely fed, and slept much less than recommended. He began to neglect his personal hygiene a little, and rejected the prescriptions of his doctors. No wonder his health deteriorated rapidly and grew old, which distressed his brothers, but no one could persuade him to deviate from his path of self-destruction. The fact that Victoria gave birth to six sons and daughters in those years only added bitterness to his martyrdom, reminding his that she had an active sex life with her husband. Finally, the body of Lord Melbourne could not take any more and suffered a stroke. Then his deteriorated health continued to wane until that day, November 24, 1848, Lord Melbourne was at the gates of the final outcome. Lying in his bed his image was very sad for anyone who had known him in his best years. He had become a premature old man, who looked twenty or thirty years older than his age, that for the average age and the life expectancy of his time already it was by itself a relatively advanced age. In the past he had been a handsome and strong man, now was a pile of bones and hides, his skin wrinkled and his eyes sat and off. He had the appearance of an unburied corpse a body destroyed by old age and disease. Inside he had already resigned himself and although he could not help feeling scared like all human beings in facing death, on the other hand, he felt a certain relief to see the end of his suffering, a life full of disappointment and sadness. Because, although losing Victoria was the final blow and the most painful in the end, before that her, he had already suffered other terrible blows of life. His wife, the first woman he loved, was unfaithful and ended up abandoning him to go with his lover, none other than the famous poet Lord Byron. Then she broke with her lover and wrote a novel where she told all the details of her adventure, aggravating the public scandal that humiliated Lord Melbourne. Though he and his wife later reconciled, their marriage had been destroyed and it was only a formal reconciliation, to try to repair the damage to their image, and for their son. That was another blow for him because with his wife had a son and a daughter, but his daughter died just 24 hours after birth, and his son was born with a mental illness, 
which long after his time would be known as autism. In the end his wife died and a few years later the son of both. With so many blows of fate it was normal that Lord Melbourne at heart wanted to die and give up a life that had only given him pain. His physical suffering was very great, but the soul's suffering was much greater. Little by little he went into the final dream, began to feel that the darkness was invading him, that he stopped feeling the perceptions that his physical body transmitted to him, that the voices of those who were around his dying bed were fading, and that their silhouettes vanished, that their eyelids fell and that an abnormal, overwhelming, thick darkness was spreading through their consciousness. But at the end of that darkness a light seemed to emerge, like at the end of a tunnel, a light to which it was approaching, while a sense of peace was invading him, and in that light diffuse silhouettes began to emerge, but in the bottom he felt he was familiar with, familiar people. He wanted to reach that light and immerse himself in it, he wanted to approach those silhouettes and discover the people they belonged to, he wanted to find some comfort, some love. He wanted to find at last the love that had been so elusive in his life earthly. But then he felt something pull at him, as if he wanted to keep him from the light and the silhouettes that awaited him in that light, and when he turned around trying to see what was pulling him, he found only a mass of light, multicolored energy that adopted whimsical forms. Something inside him told him that it was he who had invoked that, that presence that was born of his desperate yearning. Suddenly he seemed to see that among the mass of lights without form, was formed an ethereal and translucent face that floated in the air, a face very familiar, although he had several years without seeing it in his earthly life. Victoria. Then he felt dizzy because he felt like fell from the sky to a large void beneath him, and he saw all the images running at great speed until they merged and disappeared, and suddenly he returned to the darkness but the darkness more familiar and normal of to have his eyes closed, the sleep before waking. Slowly he opened his eyes and the light hurt his eyes, as if he saw it for the first time. When his gaze became accustomed to the light again, he blinked and then, to his surprise, discovered that he was not lying in his bed but sitting in his old armchair in his library at Brockett Hall. He did not understand anything, a moment before. He was dying in his bed and now he was sitting in his favorite armchair in his library, to complete his astonishment, he extended his hands to see them and make sure he was not sleeping and then checked that instead of the clothes of sleeping on his sickbed, he wearing one of the costumes he used to go out on the street, or even going to Parliament or to Buckingham Palace, Victoria's official residence. From being was dying in his bed and dressed in dirty sleeping clothes, to sitting in the library dressed neatly a few moments later. He really did not understand anything. But his astonishment was greater, over when he turned and saw a stranger standing by a window, staring at him while holding a glass full of liquor and with his other hand a book of luxurious red cover. He was a relatively tall man, not much in reality, who appeared to be in his forties, well carried. It was of normal texture, perhaps with a few extra kilos. He had light brown hair, a few grey hairs and a face with elegant and manly features. His skin seemed to wear a light sun tanning, and when Lord Melbourne had the opportunity to study it better he seemed to have the appearance of a Mediterranean European. The man was dressed in a fashionable suit, dark blue with a white shirt and a tie of the era. Lord Melbourne, you finally wake up. I must confess that I was getting impatient, but do not worry, we are still well on time, on the itinerary said the man with a friendly smile, while closing the book and depositing it on a table, by the way, I congratulate you, a brandy very good, although I particularly prefer whiskey, he added raising the glass and then leaving it on the table next to the book. Who are you? What are you doing in my house? Lord Melbourne asked suspiciously and nervously, rising to his feet. A very pertinent question, Lord Melbourne but in order to answer you first we must do something. Would you be so kind as to look at yourself in that mirror that you have stored in the second drawer of your desk? Said the man in a calm and kind tone. Lord Melbourne was surprised to hear that, for the stranger knew that he had a small mirror inside his desk. For a moment he was tempted to shout for help from the servants, but for some reason he dismissed the idea, and decided to do as the man suggested. Without taking his eyes off the intruder, 
he approached the desk and slowly pulled out the mirror and saw himself in it, and as he did so he felt his whole body trembling and almost dropped the mirror. He was surprisingly young, as young as he was more than ten years before, with wonder he caressed his own cheeks, and he saw himself again and again, seeing one profile and the other. Let's see, Lord Melbourne, a moment ago you were dying in your bed, you was at the decisive moment, feeling sinking into death and leaving this world, now, you are here in your library, dressed elegantly, and with a physical appearance incredibly rejuvenated, as you were more than a decade ago. And as you may have noticed, the aftermath of your stroke has disappeared, you walk and talk perfectly, you are strong and healthy. And another surprising thing, you're talking to a stranger that you've never seen before in your life, yet he appear in the middle of your library as if nothing, drinking your brandy and reading your books. If we put all that data together, what would be your conclusion, Lord Melbourne? Lord Melbourne stared at the bewildered stranger, and then a shadow of fear and disbelief covered his face. I'm dead? Asked Lord Melbourne in a broken voice. No, not exactly, you will see. Lord Melbourne, your archaic human mind is not capable of understanding the enormous complexity of the universe. Between what you call death and the earthly life there are many intermediate states, and there are many types of deaths. I could also tell you that there are many parallel worlds or universes, the reality you know is just a little brush stroke of the big picture. But for the sake of simplicity, it is true that you have just passed through the trance of death, but still it is still here, alive that is clear to you Lord Melbourne, you are still alive and better than ever, if you do want call it a miracle, if you can assimilate it better, said the man in a pedagogical and relaxing tone. Lord Melbourne did not know what to think, and less than to feel. I was confused, terribly confused. If what you say is true, then, who are you? An angel? Asked Lord Melbourne in disbelief. Ha ha ha. The stranger burst out laughing, disconcerting even more Lord Melbourne, I hope not, because what I did last night with those prostitutes was not very appropriate for an angel. Listen to me, Lord Melbourne, I understand it to be the first thing you can think of, for your time and religious influence in it, although you are not particularly religious, but I am not an angel, although in a way, my work sometimes looks like the work of an angel. Certainly I am a kind of messenger, an intermediary between the heads above and the beings of lower scales, seen thus, could be an angel, a ghost, a genie, a goblin, or whatever you prefer, replied the friendly man. And what is your name, sir? asked Lord Melbourne. My name? Every person knows me with a different name, let's see, I think you'll call me Connor, is that all right? Lord Melbourne shrugged. Then it will be Connor, said the man, extending his hand. Lord Melbourne hesitated, as if afraid to shake his hand. Quiet, Lord Melbourne, I do not bite, the man said mockingly. Lord Melbourne did not understand why the man gave him tranquility, and even a faint smile appeared on Lord Melbourne's lips. He extended his arm and gave a cordial handshake. Very well Lord Melbourne you will surely wonder what I am doing here and what will happen now. It is not like this. Lord Melbourne nodded. Lord Melbourne, up there, they are not blind. They are aware of all that you have sacrificed, of how you have given everything for your country, for Britain, and for the beings you have loved, especially for one. They are also aware of all the pain that you received in return. That is why they have decided to balance a little the scales and compensate for so much suffering, as well as rewarding you for your sense of duty, so do not be scared, because from now on some nice things will start happening. Now please, would you be so kind as to read the date of that newspaper on your desk? Said Connor. Intrigued Lord Melbourne grabbed the newspaper and a look of infinite surprise appeared on his face. April 23, 1838 it is impossible! exclaimed Lord Melbourne, and he had to rest his hands on the desk surface when he felt dizzy. Lord Melbourne, at these times, you must assume that nothing is impossible, if, a few moments ago, you were on November 24, 1848, 
and now we have regressed for more than ten years, at least in this reality. Hence his reborn youth. But, does that mean? Lord Melbourne was about to say. I'm afraid we do not have much more time for explanations, at least for now, since we have a slight delay in our itinerary. Listen to me, Lord Melbourne well, this is very important, these are the rules of the game, in the first place, you can see and hear me, but the rest of the people cannot do it unless I want to. That's very handy when I give you directions in front of others, without others being aware, but the other side of the coin is that you should not talk to me in front of others, only when we are alone. Secondly, from now on you will see and hear things that are going to surprise you and will move you the floor, but I advise you not to rush to react, you will take a deep breath and wait a few moments before reacting. Also, forget everything you know about your life, or what you think you know, think that your biography here is totally different. At this moment the first surprise in this adventure is approaching, remember what I said, because that surprise is coming through that door, in 9, 8, 7, 6. Said Connor watching the hour in a pocket watch as he walked back, moving away of Lord Melbourne. Wait. I do not understand. Lord Melbourne was about to say. Minus three, two, one. At that moment the library door opened and a little girl came running in and clung to Lord Melbourne's legs. Uncle William! exclaimed the little girl in a cheerful and sweet way. Lord Melbourne's mouth dropped open, and his gaze went from the girl to Connor, who was still leaning against the window, smiling broadly. I! stammered Lord Melbourne. At that moment another person crossed the threshold of the door, a mature woman of strong texture and cold face and serious. Lord Melbourne's eyes widened as he saw her. Baroness Lazen! exclaimed Lord Melbourne, surprised.